Hi! Well, I completely come a guts on the previous video where I measured the noise on this Ryden RD6006 power supply here, and I was measuring much higher than spec here. I was measuring in the order of, you know, half a volt peak to peak noise, and it looked pretty horrible. Well, it turns out that dumbass Dave didn't engage his brain and actually measured this wrong. So let me show you what I did wrong and how to measure this properly. Oh! So here's the signal here that I was measuring at uh, 6 amps, and as you can see, uh, peak to peak, um, just over 500 millivolts there, and you can see that uh, there is some ripple on there, so there's some lower frequency ripple. The ripple's only in the order of two divisions, you know, uh, 40 millivolts actually. Um, it's not that bad, but I completely come a gutsa on measuring this peak to peak stuff. Why? And how? Aha! Uh -huh. It's an interesting question. And it's a real trap for young players, including dumbass Dave, when he doesn't have his brain engaged. Because, well, I knew this, but I just, well, just completely forgot. Come a gutsa. So the problem lies, as you might have guessed, in my probing technique, channel 2 there, I've just got a regular, uh, like, 50 ohm RG58 uh, coax BNC, and I've got one of these uh, BNC to... Uh, banana plug adapters and I'm plugging this directly into my power supply so this is actually it's using uh, coax like this is actually a pretty good way to get nice high frequency uh, bandwidth measurement have I done a separate video on that I'm not sure yeah I might have to but it while using coax is a brilliant way to get high frequency uh, bandwidth of probing stuff especially low signal measurements because often you don't want to use your uh, traditional times 10 probe here which uh, uh, contrary to its name actually divides your signal by 10 so if you've got if you're trying to measure a you know 10 millivolt noise the last thing you want to do is be dividing it by 10 to give you like only one millivolt so then it's much harder to measure on your oscilloscope you're you know you're really down in the low end uh, noise of your oscilloscope there so yeah you want to avoid the times 10 probe if possible and using a bnc is one way to do that but I completely goofed it. While this is fine for measuring the low frequency ripple stuff, it's no good for the high frequency content. Although in theory, it should be. What have I done wrong? <laughs> Put your thinking cap on and try and figure it out before the next clip. And no, it has absolutely nothing to do with the fact that these leads are just like uh, flapping around in the breeze. They're unshielded for a reasonable length here. That's not the problem. Now, just a regular uh, coax like this is, of course, going to measure um, zero ohms for the conductor in there. Well, basically, right? It's, it's just a wire that goes directly through. But And this will be important in a minute, trust me. Now, this uh, coax, of course, is a uh, shielded uh, coaxial cable. You've got the center conductor, and then you've got the outer braid as well. And this is a transmission line. Uh, as far as high frequency content goes, and the stuff we were seeing on the oscilloscope, that high frequency ringing content, um, that's all about uh, high frequency content and when viewing uh, high frequency content like that you need a proper transmission line like a coaxial cable and you can see that this is a RG58 uh, CU cable which you know they're pretty industry uh, standard cable it's not bad uh, coax and it's got relatively high bandwidth so it's not a problem with the coax in itself but the part where we've come a gutsy here is that because it's a transmission line, it has to be have a matched impedance in the system. Otherwise, you're going to get mismatch. And as a result, what we're going to see on our oscilloscope is um, any ringing or high frequency content like this, because we've got a mismatched transmission line, mismatched impedances, it's going to effectively, in this case, amplify the uh, the what's actually happening here. This switch in power supply does actually have noise, as we'll see in a minute. We'll do a proper comparison with um, uh, some proper probing, but in this particular case, it's going to amplify that and give us a much different result. In this case, like half an order of magnitude different result than what we're expecting. So yeah, it can really play a big role matching your coax cable. 
Now, of course, this is a 50 ohm impedance coaxial cable. So what we need to do is actually match the impedance. And there's two ways to do this. The traditional method is if your oscilloscope had 50 ohm input uh, impedance termination, you could just enable that and Bob's your uncle. But you can come a gutsa with this very easily when measuring power supplies like this. Now, we're only measuring uh, five volts here, but five squared, V squared on R to calculate power, 25 divided by uh, 50 ohms, that's going to give you half a watt. So you need at least a half a watt rated uh, 50 ohm load in this particular case to actually do that. So I happen to have one here. This is good old HP, none of that Agilent or uh, Keysight rubbish. This is a 50 ohm one watt um, uh, Terminator, but it's a like an inline one and they're just cooler. So if we stick that in like that, Bingo, look at this, there you go, there's our signal. We're now talking 143 millivolts peak to peak instead of 500. So that is our true signal that we're getting, not the one that we'll see in before. Oh. But there's another way to do this, especially if you're measuring higher voltage uh, power supplies like this. So you can just do this with a 50 ohm resistor. You don't have to put it at the end of the coax cable here. You can actually put it in the front of the coax cable like this. So I've got a 50 ohm resistor. It's actually 51, uh, good enough for Australia, hanging off here. So let's plug our coax directly back in like we were before and we get our horrible, you know, 500 millivolt signal. But l instead of probing it from here, let me probe it from the other side of this 50 ohm resistor. Bingo! We're getting uh, 200 millivolts uh, peak to peak uh, because we no longer have the 50 ohm termination load here. So yeah. But anyway, you can put in just a 50 ohm terminator. It doesn't matter whether it's at the start of the coax or at the end like that. You've just got to terminate it properly. But I know what you're saying, Dave, stop dicking around with this coax cable stuff. Just use your oscilloscope probe. Well, the duh, of course we can just use our oscilloscope probe. So let's try that now. I've got that plugged into channel one. Let's hook that up. I'm not putting it on the other side of the resistor. I'm just using that as a connection point. And bingo, there it is there. There's our same signal. We're 50 millivolts uh, per division now. Uh, and measurement uh, around about 210 millivolts uh, peak to peak. So that's with our probe in uh, times 10 like this. So it's actually uh, dropping that uh, signal down to uh, effectively uh, 5 millivolts instead of uh, 50 millivolts per division and that's okay for large uh, amplitudes like we get in here but for much smaller levels of noise that you're trying to measure you don't want to use the times 10 position like this so anyway sick oh it's come off there we go there's our actual uh, signal using a a properly compensated times 10 probe like this. And yes, I have done the uh, compensation adjustment on here, which is important. Because let me show you, if you don't compensate your probe properly in times 10 mode, whoa, look, you can really come a gutsa and measure the wrong signal amplitude. Look at that. See, we can actually get the incorrect level. So make sure you compensate your probes correctly in times 10 mode. And of course you compensate your probe using your uh, compensation adjustment on the front there and you can see it's peaking and whoop, go down like that. But you'll notice that if I switch that to times one, compensation does absolutely nothing because it's not a thing in times one mode. So there you go, you get your tongue at the right angle, probe is compensated. So now you're ready to measure your signal in this case, the uh, noise that we want to measure, or the high frequency content, um, it, you've now got a high bandwidth compensated probe. But, uh -huh, there's one thing. But if we go into the uh, vertical menu here, you'll notice that I've had my bandwidth limit turned on. There it is, bandwidth. This is the 20 megahertz bandwidth limit. I could turn that off and look, it's going to be completely different. So why would I want the 20 megahertz bandwidth uh, limit turned on? Well, it's basically due to convention. Uh, almost like as a de facto standard, uh, noise is measured over a 20 megahertz bandwidth. So if you go look up data sheets for any uh, power supply that specifies noise, uh, for example, it's usually specified over a DC to 20 megahertz bandwidth. And this is why almost every scope, practically every scope on the market has a 20 megahertz uh, bandwidth limit like this. 
Don't ask me where exactly that came from and why the industry standardized on 20 megahertz. It just did. And that's why every scope has a 20 megahertz bandwidth limit. And when you're doing noise measurements like this, you should have the 20 megahertz bandwidth enabled because that's just by definition. Like you don't have to, if you want to specify your noise over a different bandwidth, like the full 100 megahertz, uh, or 200 megahertz bandwidth of this um, scope, uh, even though I'm only using a 100 megahertz probe here, um, then knock yourself out. But that's not industry standard. Use 20 megahertz, please. But you might be thinking, and you should be thinking, but Dave, this is coaxial cable, and it is, and it's not 50 ohm terminated. So why can these probes work without uh, the 50 ohm termination at either the front or the end of the uh, cable like this? Well, that has to do with the particular uh, design and construction of oscilloscope probes. Now, I've done a whole video on this, um, time, Secret of Times One Oscilloscope Probes Revealed, and I highly recommend that you actually take a look at that video. But if we actually measure the resistance, just like we did before, of an oscilloscope probe, let's put it in times one mode like that, Okay, so we're just measuring the conductor through the middle. Of course, we, we got zero before, because in a regular coax, it's just a single strand uh, copper going right through the middle like that. But on an oscilloscope probe, aha, 330 ohms. And in that other video, I've actually taken apart a probe and I've showed you why. Because it's a lossy coax. They do this deliberately inside the cable. They don't just use regular copper. They use a different, uh, like, nichrome uh, type material and they give it a little bit of wiggle 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 yeah in the middle and that actually creates a lossy coax and that's why oscilloscope probes are specifically designed and matched for the one megahertz and uh, capacity front end of oscilloscopes whereas coaxial cables while whilst you can get much better higher bandwidth from them than an oscilloscope probe because a a passive oscilloscope probe like the, the best ones you can get sort of like stop at uh, 500 megahertz, really. So you can get much higher than that using a uh, like regular coax cable, but they're less forgiving because you have to terminate them properly. Whereas your passive oscilloscope probes are specifically designed and constructed and matched for your oscilloscope. And that's the difference. So when in doubt, <laughs> use your oscilloscope probe. I didn't. I was just like lazy Dave and just plugged in the... Um, coax like this and well, yeah, we can come a gutsa. So if I put both probes down there like that and Bingo look at this they match pretty well, don't they? They're both uh, 50 uh, 100 millivolts uh, per division. We can change that a little bit There we go 50 millivolts per division and well you can't there's a little bit of a difference The uh, yellow one is the uh, oscilloscope probe in times 10 mode you can see it's got like a bit more high frequency content But now we're sort of getting down to the details of the probe here Like if I touch that if I fiddle around with that you might be able to see that signal change a bit Look at that. See? Wiggle, 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 yeah. And you can, yeah, you can see that change. So, you know, you start getting down to, like, high-frequency probing techniques and stuff like that. But it's not, you see that it's not actually changing the peak up here. It's just changing the more high-frequency detail. And that's not really the important stuff when you're measuring uh, the peak-to-peak -peak noise. And, you know, we're getting, like, 200 millivolts, 210. It's sort of, you know, it, it's neither here nor there. Um, so both of those probing techniques with the 50 ohm and in front like this and the coax... Is working a treat but this is in times 10 mode what if we switch this to times one probe here look at that there we go that's times one probe and you'll notice it's a little bit higher it's not that terrific and it's lost all that high frequency content in there that we'll see in in times 10 mode and that is because if you watch my uh, times one oscilloscope probe revealed video and you should um, I explain why a times one probe has a lower bandwidth in this case it's usually about like five megahertz something like that it's not terrific so yeah it's actually lower than your 20 megahertz but you know you're still going to get your peaks like that um, you know, it, it's going to be sort of like near enough. This is not, you know, if you really want to do this with the utmost of precision, well, you know, there's better, you know, you've got to fiddle around. 
So there you have it. I uh, turned my goof into a <laughs> hopefully informative video where you learned something about uh, probing. And in this particular case, um, uh, apologies to um, RD Tech uh, Ryu, Ryu Ding. Um, their Ryden RD6006 does not have um, huge amounts of noise. In fact, it's a little bit, uh, you know, I, I need to probe it a little bit better, maybe. But, you know, it, it's its spec was 100 millivolts uh, peak to peak, I think. And we're measuring about 200 at full load. But anyway, if we drop this down to an amp, for example, but something different, you know, 130 millivolts peak to peak, RMS noise, we're only talking 8 millivolts, something like that. So it's not nearly as noisy as I made out in my review video because I goofed it. So, you know, yeah, I might still do a video investigating how to, like, take the edge off some of that uh, ringing in there. Uh, maybe we need to put some internal ferrite beads um, across uh, some of the, like, the switching components like the MOSFET or, or something like that. You know, there's several ways to uh, do that depending on, uh, you know, the best mitigation uh, strategy for getting rid of that but so yeah sometimes I just don't engage my brain and I should have picked that up in the video because <laughs> I knew that but ah well you know shit happens <laughs> anyway hope you enjoyed it if you did please give it a big thumbs up as always, discuss it down below. And I might have to do a video on this soon. I'm available over on uh, library.tv or lbry.tv. So definitely go check that out. It's a decentralized uh, video sharing platform. And I've got almost a thousand, you know, 700 subscribers. I want to get over a thousand subs. You know, it feels like the early days of YouTube back in the garage and, you know, like, yeah, let's get a thousand subs on LBRY. Anyway, it's quite a nice uh, platform. It's up and coming. It's a decentralized uh, crypto based thing and definitely check it out I'll link that in down below as well anyway hope you enjoyed it catch you next time